Hey everyone, it's Smite Pants Chess here again, and we've got another game between Rashid Nesmetnov and Mikhail Tal. This was played in 1959 in the USSR Championships. Here, Nesmetnov was white, Tal was black, and we'll just get straight into it. So Nesmetnov played e4, Tal played c5, knight to f3 was played with e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes, and then a6. And we get into a timing of Sicilian variation, and now Nesmetnov actually plays knight to c3 with Tal playing queen c7. So black's got a very flexible position. The a6 pawn guards this b5 square from the knights. And it's just a matter of developing quite quickly for black now. Typically here, white usually plays a move bishop to d3. And black develops quickly with knight to f6. If castles, knight c6 takes, d takes, and f4. Again, white's position is quite good here, not too bad. Usually here, black should play e5 and um, try and stop this f-pawn and get the bishop on c8 coming out. But again, both sides are relatively equal in this position. In this game, though, Nesmetnov decided to play a tricky move, a3, guarding the b4 square, even maybe preparing b4 at some point as well. Knight c6 was played, white played bishop to e3, knight to f6, bishop to e2, and then black played bishop to d6. Um, this is a very interesting move, so it stops white from castling temporarily anyway, because it's got the queen and bishop battery hitting this h2 square. Nesmetnov played queen to d2, so most likely going to castle queenside. I was looking at bishop takes h2 here actually, winning uh, one of the pawns. After g3, maybe black could have taken another pawn. And if f takes, knight takes d4, queen takes d4, queen takes g3 with check, black just uh, gained three pawns to the bishop, and I was thinking was this worth it? But the computer seems to absolutely hate black's position after bishop f2, queen f4, then rook h4. And it deems that uh, white has a much better game even though black has three pawns for the piece. But I thought I'd have a look at it anyway. In the game though, Tal actually played bishop to e5. Two pieces are now attacking the d4 knight. And there's been a played a very interesting move here, f4, hitting the bishop on e5 and actually sacking a pawn. After Tau took on d4 with the bishop, bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, and now queen takes d4. So white just sacked a pawn because now Tau played queen takes f4, where white just sacked the f pawn. There's better play g3 in the game, but actually rook f1 was considered the best move, giving up another pawn on h2. If queen takes h2, then white can play e5, attacking the knight. If knight d5, castle queen side, and then knight takes c3, queen takes c3. If black castles, uh, white's got a really nice advantage. Even though white's just given up a few pawns, if uh, king b1, for instance, and queen takes g2, white should now play queen to e3. And we just look at black's position. So the bishop is locked in, the rook's locked in. Uh, this queen's really offside as well. And basically all white has to do is stick a rook on h1 and g1, and they have an amazing attack against this black king. For instance, if play continued d6, White can play bishop to d3. If d takes e5, then rook g1. Queen h2, rook h1, queen g2, and then something like bishop takes h7. A very nice game for white. So rook f1 was definitely possible, but I don't think actually if that was played, Tau will go pawn grabbing anyway. But in the game, g3 was played, hitting the queen. Tau retreats the queen to c7. And now Nesmet have played e5. And knight d5 is played. White takes on d5, e takes d5, and white could have regained the pawn with um, queen takes d5 here, but then Tau would have probably played queen takes c2. However, white could finish this off with bishop to c4, attacking the f7 square. We get into some interesting positions if this happened. For instance, if um, Tau did go pawn grabbing in this variation with queen takes b2, white can take on f7. If king d8, white can castle. And I think white has a slight advantage here. If play continues with check, king h1, b5, bishop d5, and rook a7, the computer stockfish actually gives white a slightly better in this variation. And I tend to agree because what white's going to do is stick a rook on c1 or d1 and try and push this e6 pawn. Now white should have a very nice advantage. If we just go back in this variation, instead of queen takes b2, black could also have castled. But again, I think white gains an advantage with castling. And they've got three pieces attacking this f7 pawn. If black tries to defend, they can just play rook takes f7, and if rook takes f7, they just play rook f1. And again, they've got three pieces attacking this f7 square. Uh, so again, this will be very nice for white. So it is tempting for white to go pawn grabbing, but in the game, there's Mendoza calmly played castled queenside. 
and still we'll probably take this d5 pawn at a later date. But tile's a bit tricky, play b5. The point is if queen takes d5 now, bishop b7, uh, white will just lose material, will lose the rook on h1 to the bishop. So for this reason, Nesmetnov played rook h f1. And now Tau played bishop to b7, securing the d5 pawn. So black is still a pawn up, doing his very best to defend this d5 square. But um, I think eventually white will be able to win this. They could even play bishop f3, for instance, now to try and win the pawn back if Nesmetnov wanted to. But actually he comes up with a very great move. He played the move e6, unleashing the queen on the g7 pawn. And a very nice trap actually if f takes e6 because then white can play bishop h5 with check. If king d8 then queen takes g7 and white's going to win the rook on h8. Just because it can't move to any of these squares if uh, even if rook to e8 there's just bishop takes. So white should win material. So e6 was a very nice move from Nesmetinov. In the game Tau took with the d pawn, d takes e6 and now queen takes g7 attacking the rook which goes to f8 to defend the f7 square. And here actually, Nesmetnov played a nice move, he played bishop h5 in the game, but bishop g4 was much stronger. This move prepares bishop takes e6. For instance, if castles now, bishop takes e6 and we play with check. The point is, if f takes e6, white can play queen takes f8, and if uh, rook takes f8, rook takes with check. King goes to d7, and then there's rook f7 to finish off. And if, uh, let's say, king d6, white can just take the queen um, and has a clear advantage with uh, the exchange up in the end game. So after bishop takes e6 in this variation, black is probably just forced to play king b8. And then white can just play bishop takes d5. Again, the point is that if uh, bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes, there's queen takes f8 to finish. And we'll probably pick up the pawn on f7. So white would have a very good position. If uh, Nesmetnov played bishop g4 here, for instance. He did play bishop h5, though. So now again, three pieces ganging up on this f7 pawn. Tau just castles queenside to get away from this attack. So in this position, black is still a full pawn up. So Nesmetnov just has to do something to gain the pawn back. He decided to own rook d to e1 first. So this could potentially prepare rook takes e6. But it doesn't work at the moment. For instance, after king b8, if uh, white plays rook takes e6 here, um, f takes e6 is just fine for black because the queen's attacking g7, and this queen takes f8 idea doesn't work because the king can hide on h7. Um, and even if rook f7 here, black's doing absolutely fine because he's moved the queen away. So, after king b8 in the game, finally Nesmetnov took on f7, rook takes f7, rook takes, and then queen takes. So, white's just regained the pawn back. And play continued on with Tau playing bishop c8 to protect e6, king d2, queen a5 check, king d1. The queen went backwards, the queen goes to f6, and there's just a bit of manoeuvring from both sides here. So queen d4, rook f8, and rook to e5 to block uh, these two pawns from advancing. So white's pretty much controlling all the dark squares at the moment. And also that rook e5 moves make sure that black can't move the c6 pawn to unleash their own bishop. So that's quite a nice move that Nesmetnov just played. But Tau just played bishop d7, so they're going to try and reroute the knight back to e8. Nesmetnov goes bishop e2, guarding this f1 square from checks. Bishop e8, bishop d3, king b7, and then rook to g5. Prentice play rook to g7. Tau guards this with rook f7, which also guards the h7 square. And in the game, Nesmetnov played queen to e5. I think, again, this was a slight misjudgment for white. I think he should play queen h8 here. Attacking the bishop on e8. If queen d7, then play h4. And if rook e7, there's c3. And white's guarding all the dark squares again. If king b6, is king c2. So maybe white should have played it this way. I feel like white's got a slight edge in this game. And I think Nesmetnov should have played it this way. Because in the actual game, after... Rook f7 from black, he played queen to e5, and now there's a trade of queens with queen takes e5, rook takes e5, and rook e7 to guard the pawn. King d2, and um, it's not bad for white, but it's uh, looking very drawish now for both sides. Black gets the king into the game, as does white with king e3, king d6, king d4, and bishop g6. There's a trade of bishops, rook g5. So, again, white's attacking this g6 square. But now Tau has a good move to play. He plays e5 with check. The king went backwards and then black defends the pawn. 
Again, this is considered dead equal, so there's really no advantage for either side at the moment. I know black's got these two past center pawns, but white should be able to hold this off, especially in a rook and king endgame. There's been a played h4 to consolidate, king e6, and now h5. So, preparing to take on g6, but uh, after king f6, attacking the rook, white is forced to trade, rook takes g6, rook takes g6, h takes g6, and then king takes g6. And this is now a dead draw, so after b3, Tau played king to f5. And here, Nesmetno should just play a move like king to f3. And I've run a variation through just to illustrate how this is a draw. For instance, if king g5, they just c3, king f5, and king f2. And the point is that white just keeps the opposition. So after king g4, just keeps the opposition with king to g2. After a5, a4, takes, takes, king h5. White just goes up and down following this black king. And again, keeps the opposition. If e4, king f2, king to e3, and king to f5, attacks um, d5. Of course, white can't take this d5 pawn, because then the e pawn would run. But even after king g4, king e3, takes, white has a nice move here, c4. The point is, after d takes c4, there's just king takes. And after several more moves, it's still a draw, because eventually, after king takes a5, king c5, there's no way for white to queen this a pawn. As we know, pawn and king end games where the pawns are on the a file or h file are often draws. And there's no way for white to queen this pawn because even here, after like king c7, black just keeps the opposition and stops the king from getting out. And actually this is a draw. However, back in the game, there's meant to have played an incredible move uh, and not a good incredible move as well. He played c4, which just blunders instantly. Um, and after d takes c4, he resigned the game. The point is, B takes C4, B takes C4. There's nothing white can do now. Uh, if G4, this king takes G4, king E4, and then just C3, king D3, and then E4. The point is white can't take this E pawn because then the C pawn runs down the board. If king takes C3, there's E3, king D3, and king F3. Um, this pawn's just going to get a queen now because it's king F2, and then just run the pawn down the board. An easy win for black. So this position was a draw, and then this position is a complete loss for White. And Tal actually went on to win the game. His first and only victory against Nezmedinov. He'd actually say, I've played four games with the Tatar Master, and the score is plus three, minus one in his favour. Moreover, my solitary win was a result of a silly mistake by my opponent in a position he should have never lost. That was Mikhail Tal. He also said, Nezmedinov obtained a completely one position, then blundered. This victory did not give me any particular pleasure. I think those quotes show what type of player Tal is. He's a chess purist. He wants both sides to play some good chess. And unfortunately, his opponent had blundered here. Of course, Tal obviously finished him off. But again, he took no satisfaction in that because he wants a good game. But anyway, there's one more game I've not covered yet, which was played in 1959, which I'll do so very soon. If you did enjoy this video, please drop a like, comment or subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a lot. I hope I'll see you in the next videos. Thank you very much.